This is Steve Adubato. More importantly, this is the Leadership Hour with Steve Adubato and my trusted colleague, Mary Gamba. How are you doing? I'm doing great today. How are you, Steve? I'm doing great. I've always said this, and I'll say it again. I love this show, not just because I'm fascinated by leadership and related topics like communication and facilitation and coaching people and mentoring people and building your brand, blah, 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 blah. It's because we learn from the smartest, the best people in the industry about these topics. And we're also joined in the studio by our longtime colleague, Laura Van Bloom, who thinks about these things as well. Right, Laura? I sure do, every day. To disclose, Laura heads up all the communication, marketing, branding, social media, and all, frankly, the relationships we have with those who fund our PBS series. And Mary, before we were joined by our good friend, Lori Roth over at Prager Metis, one of the top accounting firms around. Tell folks how they can find us. Absolutely. Steve Adubato's Leadership Hour can be found on Facebook at Steve Adubato, PhD. That's A-D-U-B-A-T-O, as well as on Twitter at Steve Adubato. You can subscribe to us on Apple Podcast and Google Play. As always, you can give us a great rating if you like what you hear. Please do. And for more tips and tools, as well as our leadership columns and communication columns, you can visit stand-deliver.com. Also want to thank the folks at East Main Media, our colleague Brian. Brian Brodeur. Brian, you doing all right? I'm doing great, Steve. Thank you. It takes a village to make this happen. And we are now pleased to be joined by our friend and colleague, Lori A. Roth, managing partner, Northeast Region Prager Metis. That's an accounting firm, is it not? It definitely is. Accounting and advisory services. Lori, do us a favor. Uh, We're doing great. Lori, do us a favor. Tell us about the footprint, if you will, of Prager Metis. Sure. Well, Prager Metis is a top 50 accounting firm in the country, and we're also international. We have offices in London, as well as offices throughout the Northeast and L.A. and Miami. And we service all types of businesses, individuals. We have a lot of niche markets. Basically, we try and be full service to all of our clients. And let me share this. I have had a relationship with Lori and some of the other senior executives at Prager Metis, primarily out of the New York operation. I've done a fair amount of coaching and leadership development, communication coaching in the accounting world, and I've come to know the folks at Prager. And what's interesting to me, Lori, is that while your title is, in fact, managing partner, Northeast Region, you have a massive portfolio of responsibilities. One area that I've interacted with you in is, quote unquote, talent development, developing high potential people, dealing with people who may not be so high potential. How would you describe your approach to developing the best of who you have and helping them get even better? How do you do that, which is a huge leadership question? Sure. So we did a big strategic plan a few years back, and one of the main pillars of the plan was the leadership and management, and I was charged with leading that pillar. So what we decided to do was really try and figure out how we could make everyone basically be the best that they could be. In a service organization, people who are partners are automatically perceived to be leaders, but as we know, not all of them definitely are. So we decided to develop different programs to create paths for people at all levels and to bring in people like yourself to help us to get these people to be the best that they could be and identify who those future leaders are so we can make sure that we do everything that we can to help to develop them and help them to help us to meet our goals. This is one of the challenging questions that I struggle with all the time. Mary and I talk about it. Mary actually runs our company, Stand and Deliver, on a day-to-day basis. Laura works on the not-for-profit side on our PBS production company, the Caucus Educational Corporation. But we all talk about this, and it's this. Laurie, if someone in the accounting world has strong technical skills, he or she knows all the tax laws, they understand the most recent federal changes in Washington, they can help their clients do those things, they're great on the auditing side, they're brilliant on their CPA exam, boom, passed it first time. Does that mean they have what it takes to be a truly great leader? Not necessarily. I think we all learn that from experience. They can be maybe a leader in their field, but maybe they can't necessarily be a leader in their business or in their company or make that kind of a contribution. I think honestly, that great leaders create great leaders, right? So I think everybody has to surround themselves with the right people with the right skill set. And they might have the right skill set to be a top tax person or a top audit person. They might not have the skill set to become a leader of the firm or in the industry. Here's the interesting question. In a series that we recently did at Prager, it was a leadership series with communication skills. We talked about how to run better meetings, how to coach and mentor your people, how to give stronger presentations, because, Lori, let's agree that executive presence, which is a term we like to use a lot, it's important that if someone 
in your world or in our world gets up to give a presentation at a meeting or in a conference, he or she has to be clear, concise, persuasive, and frankly, confident. That's not easy Correct. for people who have learned technical skills and frankly have been working in their own, I'm not gonna say cubby because I'm dating myself, but they're in their own silo and you say all of a sudden now, get out there and be that person. Correct, there's a lot of challenges that I face. You know, typically people think of accountants as having pocket protectors and not being the most social people that there are. And, you know, that's not necessarily true. And that is a stereotype. But there are certainly people across the board who struggle with some of those things. Do they push back? By the way, we're talking with Lori Roth, who is with Prager Metis. She's managing partner, Northeast region at one of the larger accounting firms in the nation. My question is this. Do some of your folks push back when you say, listen, We'd like to coach you. We'd like to mentor you. We'd like you to be in this leadership initiative. And they go, hey, wait a minute. What's wrong with me? What's my problem that you're doing this? You ever get that? I will say that most people have embraced it. The bigger pushback we get is they might not have time. They're overwhelmed with other things that they already have on their plate. I think most people have really been receptive to being offered that help and to being offered that assistance and growth and development plan. Mary, how about this? We often talk about some people are, quote, more coachable than others. What does that mean? We find that a lot. I think sometimes people are more open to coaching. And often, Steve and I will say it's not how you come in, whether you're resistant to the coaching, but it's how you leave. But Lori, I did want to bring up one main point, being a woman in a financial accounting field that's predominantly men, I'm assuming, is it still? leaders. I believe it is. Am I wrong with sure. that? Okay. As far I as in leadership that, managing uh, partner positions, Steve is on shaking his head. Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll, on the I'll higher defer end. To Lori. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, Lori, you know, how do you feel? What are some tips and tools for women coming out of college, finishing their CPA, getting out there and being confident and going and reaching for that top position? What advice can you offer to them as a woman in leadership? Well, I think that just to answer your question a little bit, we see incoming classes much more even nowadays between men and women, but definitely at my level or higher up in the organizations, it is male dominated. So coming out of school and people entering the field as a woman, I think there really should be no difference. And honestly, I would approach it as though there is no difference. You are who you are and you want to be the best that you can be. And you should be confident and know that you're going to succeed. And luckily, in today's day and age, I don't think there are as many barriers to people like that. Hey, Lori, check this out. By the way, Steve Adubato, Mary Gamba, Laura Van Bloom here in the Leadership Hour podcast and radio show on AM 970. Check us out every Sunday at 2 p.m. on that great radio station from Lower Manhattan, AM 970. Lori Roth, let me ask you this. You and your colleagues bring in millennials, younger people. Uh, Laura, do you know the technical definition of a millennial now in terms of age, you know? I just know they're much younger than me. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that contribution. That would make all of us and much, some much more than others. Much younger than all of us, uh, both Lori and all of us here in the office as well. And some more than others. Thanks so much. Uh, not Lori, by the way. Uh, Lori was a partner at 21. No. Uh, Lori, how about this? Do you coach and mentor them any differently because there's – a belief on the part of many who I work with. They say, you know, those millennials, they can't be coached. They've been coddled their whole lives. The whole everyone gets a trophy for participating. And now all of a sudden you're giving them hard feedback. You're telling them where they didn't do well. And they're folding, quitting. I can't. I don't have to listen to this. My parents told me I was number one. Am I exaggerating? Right. Well, a little bit. I'm definitely doing a little bit differently. And a lot of our policies and procedures throughout the firm are a little bit different because quite honestly, we're learning from them and we have to kind of go with how things are changing, right? So we have things that add flexibility. We've learned that millennials want to have as much kind of one-stop shopping and everything in their work environment. We do a lot of altruistic work. We have a Prager Metis Foundation that's just begun to make contributions to meaningful organizations, and we try and get them involved at an early age and put them on those paths. So some of the changes we've made due to the millennials, I think, have benefited all of us. We have things like dress for your day so everyone doesn't have to be wearing a suit and tie every day, which is how it was when I started. And we have flexible work hours and things that make everybody's life better. So I think in some ways we have embraced those changes, but I don't think that we train or coach them any differently. I just think we have to be attuned to what their needs are and how to, as I said earlier, make them the best that they can be. I've known Lori long enough to know that she expects nothing less than the standard of excellence for everyone at the firm, regardless of their age. (laughs) Let me ask you this last question. 
You and your colleagues are working to, quote, build a brand. This is Laura's area for us. She's been building our brand for more than a few years. You're expanding into different markets. How do you build the brand of a firm in an area heretofore where they never were? Right. So what we've been doing is working on our culture. I think it starts from inside. So we have a culture internally and externally, and we try and project that in everything that we do. So I think that that really helps us expand into other areas and to bring our brand and our standard and everything that we want to represent to wherever we go. Finally, finally, someone says, Lori and I have had this conversation offline. Oh, I'm not one of those people that speaks in a public situation. I'd rather be behind the scenes. By the way, Mary told me this for years before I just forced her to come out and And speak in public. (laughs) What do you do when someone says, I can't do that. And by the way, you're asking me to sell, to be involved in business development. You know, I signed up to be an accountant. I'm not one of those people, except in order to be a partner and a leader in any firm, yours or any others, you have to have those skills. How the heck do you deal with that? Well, we partner people up. So we have mentors and we have people that help to guide them. I think that the more confident you are, the easier it is to do those things. So how do you build the confidence? You build the confidence by letting them experience in a situation that they feel more comfortable until they can get to the point where they can branch out and go a little bit outside of their comfort zone, if you will. And eventually, hopefully, that becomes their comfort zone. Well said. Our colleague and friend, Lori Roth, who is managing partner Northeast Region Prager Metis. Lori, I want to thank you for taking the time. We're taping in the dead of summer. I shouldn't say dead. It's in the heat of summer. It's about 100 degrees. <laughs> but by the way, I always love when people say, what's your busy season like? And you ask Lori that. She's like, um, when is it not the busy season? <laughs> so, exactly. So, Lori, exactly. I want to thank you for joining us, particularly with your schedule and sharing your insights and perspective on a lot of things. Say hello to everyone at the firm, okay? I will. Thanks a lot. Thanks for your time. Have a great day. This is Steve Adubato. That's Mary Gamba. This is Laura Van Bloom. That's Brian Brodeur. When we come back, I promise we're going to break all this down and try to make sense of what Lori said and also raise some other issues about leadership communication related topics. Steve Adubato, The Leadership Hour. We'll be right back. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. That's stand-deliver.com. This edition of the Steve Adubato Leadership Hour has been made possible by New Jersey Resources. Hey, Mary, why don't you bring us back in for people who are just tuning in? Absolutely. For those just tuning in, we were just listening to Lori Roth. She was managing partner Northeast Region of Prager Medis. What do you mean what? She still is. Nothing's happened, right? She is. Yes, yes. No, she was great. (laughs) Gave a lot of great tips and tools. And speaking of tips and tools, I will segue beautifully. Please. You can go to our website where you can find free tips and tools via Steve's Leadership Columns. And that website is stand-deliver.com. You can also find out information about Steve's various books, his most recent, which is Lessons in Leadership, which has a lot of great leadership tools. And also for free, if you want to follow us on Facebook, you can do so at Steve Adubato, Ph.D., that's A-D-U-B-A-T-O, as well as on Twitter at Steve Adubato. And you can subscribe to our podcast at Apple Podcast, as well as on Google Play. I swear, no more plugging. All right. (laughs) Okay, Steve Adubato, (laughs) A-D-U-B-A-T-O. PhD. Let me tell you something. Just because your name is in the title doesn't mean arrived. you could be so disrespectful. Laura, let me ask you this. This is Laura Van Bloom, who's the head of marketing communications, promotion, client relations at our not-for-profit company, the Caucus Educational Corporation, which produces programming on a variety of platforms, PBS, Fios, online, everywhere. Laura, we've had these conversations, me, you, Mary, on a regular basis about developing coaching, giving feedback to. And I know people say, oh, we kind of heard you talk about that before, Steve. Well, the reason we're talking about it again is because something new will happen every week, every day that challenges my preconceived ideas about how to develop and coach people. But it's my obsession, and I'm not sure I'm doing it, quote, unquote, right. Best practices in coaching and mentoring and developing people around you. Your thoughts? Yeah, I think a good leader, kind of what Lori was talking about, sets the culture, sets the tone, creates an environment where people want to excel and want to lead. But a good leader, I think, is truly tested when something goes wrong. You know, we're all... Some things happen? Oh, imagine that. <laughs> you know, we're human. There's always going to be a mistake. Something happens. And I think the big challenge for a strong leader is how do you handle that? How do you coach through that and what kind of changes are made on the other end? So we had a situation in our office where a mistake was made 
And what you did, which I thought was a good thing to do, you brought everybody this together. This is in one instance where I did the right thing. <laughs> <laughs> we marked it down with a little heart. Um, oh, th- see, see, see what happens. You're That's not why in the we office. Want Laura with, here. Okay, so She's something happened. All day. Hold it. Here's the thing. Something happens, but in our world, that thing that happens winds up on the air. Right. There's a little bit of a difference. Sure. Go it's ahead. got bigger Pick implications. So what was wrong and the mistake manifested itself in a way that others, I'd like to say millions, but we're not the Today Show. <laughs> there are a high number of people who see it, particularly people who are stakeholders in what we do. They saw it. We saw it. I saw it. I said, wait a minute. That's not right. So there was sort of a two-step process to address that issue. One was you reached out directly to the person who you thought was directly involved with the What time? On a Saturday morning. Someone said to me, Steve, why did you send an email before 9 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday to that person and team members? Why didn't you, quote, wait till regular work hours Monday, you say? There's no more regular work hours. What? There are no more regular work hours. It was a weekend. Now, the person has the option to whether or not they want to respond to you. But I think if there's something happening and you want to shoot it out there, then you do that. But I do By think- By the way, our programs are on the weekends. We right, should right, say right. that. Yeah. yeah, right. So you say, but I do think that people have the option to respond. Now, in our culture, what we have said is at least acknowledge it. Got your email. We'll talk about it first thing Monday morning if that's going to be appropriate. So I think in all cases, you need to acknowledge it. But I also think the reality is, in today's world, no one works nine to five anymore. So where's the coaching? Where's the coaching? Where's the feedback? And how does one, any leader listening, anyone who wants to be a leader, anyone who thinks they are a leader, what is the best practice in terms of tone, demeanor, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to put the other person or persons in the best frame of mind to receive that feedback slash coaching without, dare I say, the D word, being defensive. Well, I think that's very challenging, but I think it's getting the person to acknowledge if there's an issue or a problem and what was the breakdown, what was the problem. Not yelling, hey, you made a mistake, you screwed this up. Just like, can you walk me through what the process is? Can you walk me through where the breakdown happened and why did that breakdown happen and how do we change it moving forward? So, you know, people are emotional and people might get upset about things, but I think the better approach is to actually have the person acknowledge what the problem is and come up with the solution and themselves. what happens, Mary? No one's going to disagree with anything Laura Van Bloom just said. Correct. My obsession, as you know, is when the other person or persons do not, quote, accept responsibility. By the way, this is true in Washington. This is true in the White House. It's true in Congress. It's true in the State House in New Jersey. It's true in corporations all across this nation. It's true in not-for-profits. It's true in schools. Both of you have young people, otherwise known as sons, (laughs) who are in school. How often do you see principals, superintendents, teachers, quote, taking responsibility as opposed to, it's very complicated. There was a miscommunication. There were many people involved, which means no one takes responsibility. When that happens as a leader and there is no responsibility taken, I am literally banging my head against the wall saying I can't move forward. We can't move forward until that first step happens. Am I right that you think I'm obsessed in an unhealthy way about that? Yes and no. It's not about me because I'm not the only one. Right. And one thing that I have learned in our time together is, number one, when a mistake is made, of course, as a leader, you need to address the issue. You need to be immediate, say what the issue is. On the receiving side, if I'm the one that made the mistake. How about if you don't think you made a mistake? Well, sometimes you and I have agreed to disagree in those situations, and that should not be the norm. Most often, if you're calling something out or if any leader is calling something out, yeah, Take it away mistake, from me and anyone. Right. What about if it's self-evident, it's black and white, everyone sees it right there? Absolutely. You need to own it. In that moment, you need to say, I made a mistake. It was an oversight. This is specifically what I did wrong. Here is what I am specifically going to do by when in order to fix it so this way it doesn't happen again. Those are the most important things when a mistake is made. Laura, why do you think that is? Laura Van Bloom, Mary Gamba, Steve Adubato, Brian Brodeur, The Leadership Hour. Why do you think it's so hard for so many, including teenagers, Mm -hmm. between the four of us, we have- A lot of kids. We have three teenage boys right now. I don't know about you, but I have a hard time getting a 14 and a 16 year old to quote unquote, accept responsibility. And when someone's 26, 36, 46, 56, I don't find it much easier. I think it's part of human nature is people don't want to be wrong. I didn't make a mistake. I'm right all the time. Or it was complicated. Yeah, right. And especially teenagers, you know, because they're just going to buck the system and go against their parents. But in a workplace, I think a lot of times people think, if I make a mistake, 
I look weak. If I make a mistake, I look lesser than. Versus if you step up and own a mistake and say, this is what I'm going to do different the next time, you'll get 10 times more respect. Versus, oh, no, no, couldn't do it. It was complicated. No, You've no, done it. I don't want to say 10 times because that would make it sound like <laughs> put it this 10 way. times today. You, no, no. You've done it. Mary Gamba and Laura Van Bloom and I have many times said, not just privately, but in emails to each other, face to face with each other. And, and I'm not saying, oh, look at us, we're great. But here's the question. If we create a culture where we are owning our mistakes, saying, my bad, this is what I did wrong, this is why it's not okay, and this is what I'm gonna do moving forward. In my kooky head, I keep thinking, when Lori Roth was talking about creating a culture, in my mind, that creates a culture of having others on the team, everyone on the team say, wait a minute, they're doing it, why not us? It's okay to make a mistake as long as you own it. But yes, there are always but it doesn't going, always work that way. No. There's always going to be outliers. Just as much as you want to say, oh, I want my peers, my coworkers, my children, whoever the it is, yes. to be givers, to give back to the world and give to the community and do this and do that. Wanting somebody to act a certain way and respond a certain way can only go so far. Certain people are not coachable because, frankly, they believe that they are right. They believe that this is how I am. Take it or leave it. So I do believe that if you have- In the face of an obvious problem? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Again, we keep going back to this, but for anybody tuning in for the first time, you and I have worked together for 19 years. It is not common in our organization, but through the years, we've come across people who are just that. They resist admitting mistakes. For better or for worse, they are going to go to their grave and say, yeah, you want to know what? That did happen. However, here's why it happened. And Would they're that... explaining, 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 but you never hear it was right. on me. Here's my question. Do they know it? Do they know that they are not taking responsibility yes. or do they not even know? You ever know. think you don't know what you don't know? No, nope. so, not in So you think that many people, mm -hmm. if not most, actually know it was on them. Yep but are incapable and or oh, yeah. unwilling to say it. Laura, you say? Yeah, I think so. I mean, if you've screwed up, you know you screwed up. Exactly. And you may eventually convince yourself that it really wasn't your fault because <laughs> he said, she said, whatever. And maybe you get to that point. But in the moment, I think if you screw up, you know. Exactly. You know, you know what's so interesting to me is in the coaching that I do, the leadership development work I do, I, I often refer to a chapter in my book, Lessons in Leadership, which is on our website at stand-deliver.com. Mm -hmm. There's a chapter in it about great leaders step up and take responsibility. And so in the course of the book, I name a million mistakes I've made that I had to own because you get a lot of practice when you make a lot of mistakes to own it. But I talk about some people who either couldn't or wouldn't. Donald Trump's just one of them. And I wrote the book in late 2015, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe it's 2016 I finished up. We were doing a different show on the Central Park Five. Mm -hmm. Remember that? And during the Central Park Five, these four young men in New York, there was a horrible incident where this woman, Trish Miley, in 1989, was raped and assaulted. And these four young men happened to be African-American and Latino. They were accused of, of the rape, even though the, the DNA didn't match up. You're wondering where I'm going here. The reality was the DNA didn't match up. There was a weak case. Their confessions were coerced. In the process of that, Donald Trump, as a private citizen, puts out a full-page ad that says, death penalty of the Central Park Five. We find out a few years later that it was someone else who did it, who... In fact, DNA is matched who confessed to it. And I thought, can you take responsibility for putting out a full page ad calling for the death penalty for five young men who are innocent? No, I'm not doing that. I'm not apologizing for anything. It's not just about apologizing. It's the responsibility thing. I also wrote about Hillary Clinton saying, what emails? I don't even know what you're talking about in the 2016 presidential election. Something happened. Somebody took my I, I didn't know this. Oh, the BlackBerry did that. I had no idea. Someone else was in control of it. Baloney. You were sending private emails that were on a government server that wasn't secure. You did it. Point being. What the heck can we expect from those who we work with and our children when, in fact, the most public leaders refuse and or are incapable of, quote, owning it? Or apples and oranges, Laura Van Bloom. You're absolutely right. People in public office are setting an example for a lot of young minds. And corporate leaders. Yeah, and what's okay and what's not okay and what you can get away with and shoot your mouth off and say whatever you want with no backing behind it. Or hurt other people in the process and say it wasn't me. Right. I always think, and maybe I'm naive, but I always think like the best, most effective, stronger leaders are those that you want to follow because you agree with what they're saying and you love them and they're moving everybody forward and it's a positive motion, right? When you have a leader who's 
saying nasty things or negative things. They're, sure, there's going to be a coalition of people who are going to follow that person, but they're following them because they want to be mean and nasty too. There's not this positive feeling of let's move forward together. But go back to the responsibility question, because I don't want to turn this into a political discussion, which is why I mentioned Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. By the way, you can mention any number of public figures in the corporate world and the not-for-profit world and the university world, a lot of places. But I'm saying, how the heck can we create a culture of taking responsibility, of owning it, which allows us then to coach and mentor people about how to get better if, in fact, the most highly paid, the most visible, the people we're supposed to look up to very rarely do it themselves. You can use those people because you're not going to change them, right? By the way, know... sports figures as well. Exactly. They lose a game. They make a terrible mistake. Nah, that wasn't on me. Mm -hmm. I want to see the person in the locker room. I blew it. It was on me. I shouldn't have thrown My that bitch. My bad. <laughs> okay, next game. Move on. You owned it. What'd you learn from it? Right. The arguing and the fighting and the defending is so counterproductive. You're never going to change those people who truly believe that they're right, regardless of the situation. But what you can do is use them as an example, whether it's with your team in the office, whether it's with your kids, because we started off with that example as well, and say, listen, this is how this person is choosing to communicate. Do you want to be like this person? Do you want to look so ignorant and arrogant? Or do you want to take the high road? And frankly, it makes it feel better. If you make a mistake and you own it, you sleep better at night. I do. And instead of spinning around and trying to find a new way or a new lie to cover up, for me, what I take away from all of this is I use these horrible, horrible communicators when it comes to owning mistakes as an example for my kids and for people in the office to say, hey, listen, yeah, you could have done it that way, but look what happened. Nothing good came of it. Instead, here is a better approach because you're not going to change those people. You're not going to, whether they're on your team in the office or on the field. Last question on this. Got a few minutes left. This whole question of taking responsibility, owning it, all big part of the larger coaching, mentoring developing people equation. Not all of it, but a part of it. Laura, to what extent Laura Van Bloom and Mary Gamba in the studio here with Brian Brown Doer, we're taping at East Main Media. Question is this, this is the Leadership Hour. Laura, to what extent do you believe that we as leader leaders, we are the three people who run our organization day to day, we have some great people with us. To what extent can we actually help people to be significantly better than they already are when they come into our organization? Or are we only coaching on the margins? Well, it's a big question. You know, I think it's really providing people with opportunities to grow and move up. You know, it was interesting when Lori was speaking, she said... Lori Roth from Prager Metis, go ahead. Right. When she was speaking, she talked about getting people comfortable doing certain things, and then you push them up further. I think it's the same thing with us. You, you got to push people to do a little more, like get them a little bit out of their comfort zone within a safety net with help and guidance and Define the help. safety net. So let's say we have a young producer who's going to take on a new show. I'm not ready for that. Can I get more practice before you give me that? That show because I'm just not ready. Right. So you have. That was my impression of a young producer yeah, that, not wanting that, was, that job. That was, that was very nice. That was weak. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> but in that situation, you push someone to take on some more responsibility, but you have people around to support and to guide. And then that person achieves that next level. It's like, hey, I did that. I can achieve this. I can do that. But they also fail and make mistakes sure. along the way, which is part of progress. Go ahead. And then you have to say that's okay, though. You're exactly right. Part of growing is going to be making mistakes. So I think the response has to be you made a mistake let's figure out how we can fix it or what would you do differently the next time. If the response to a mistake is hostile and angry, then people are going to be afraid to make mistakes and they're not going to push themselves. So it isn't just a mistake. It isn't just putting someone in a position that is beyond what he or she may think they're capable of. Because one of the definitions I've read of a truly great leader is that he or she often sees things in others around him or her that those people don't even see in themselves. So what I'm curious about is, is one of the traits of a really great leader, as we talk about this in Leadership Hour, not only understanding that mistakes are going to be made, but expecting that mistakes will be made, anticipating that mistakes will be made, and preparing for how to deal with those mistakes and the people who make them in the most supportive, collaborative way possible. Wow, that ain't easy. But 
It's necessary. It's essential. It is to be a truly great leader. You need to expect the best plan for the worst or something like that. Uh, something Brian. like that. Yeah. <laughs> but by and the way, we also say hope is not a strategy. Hope. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> However, though, you do need to when you're putting anything together, whether you're putting agenda together for a meeting, if you're putting a tape day together in our world, in our nonprofit television, you're, you're planning a conference as we you're speak a right conference. now, you're planning whatever. Anything could go wrong, so you need to anticipate it. And when it does, you need to own it. And I just can't, you know, drive that home enough that you need to own it. Final comments. Laura, biggest mentor or coach in your professional life who really has had an impact on you becoming who you are and obviously you're going to continue to grow. Who was that and how they do it? He was a senior account guy at an ad agency that I worked for, and he allowed me to make mistakes. Like, he would push me. Everything we just said? Yeah, like, he would push me to do things or speak up in meetings or things like that. Like, share my opinion was really his push for me because I tended to be more quiet. What did it do for you? Well, it gave me more confidence because I was afraid. But when I did it and, and I got a positive response, it's like, you know positive reinforcement. You know, you do it enough times and then you feel confident. So that one person really helped, I guess, instill confidence in me to break out of my shell a little bit. Good stuff. By the way, Mary, I already know who it is. It's you. So I have to ask <laughs> you. Who? That was a layup. It was a layup. So I slam dunked it. If that's By the way, it's... Mary's up for a race. Go ahead. I'm no, sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, no, I want to turn the tables. I don't think I've ever asked you this question before. Who was your mentor? Who impacted you? I don't know how much time. Oh, seven seconds. Do we really only have seven seconds? Well, we're out of time. Out of time. Uh, Quick, say the name. <laughs> no, it's real simple. I wrote about it in the introduction of Lessons in Leadership. It was my father. And it wasn't just what I learned from him on the upside. Perseverance, assertiveness, tenaciousness, passion, a commitment to excellence that is never negotiable. But I also learned from him a whole range of leadership and communication techniques, he didn't call them that, he just called it, it's what I do, that I absolutely have worked many years to try to undo. Being overly aggressive, being blame-oriented, not letting things go when I should let them go, taking situations that happen that could be easily fixed and making a, quote, mountain out of a mohill. I did it just last week. And a whole bunch of other stuff. And also, my father would often ridicule people in a public situation to the point where it became personal. I don't think I've done that, but I also know I've made people feel pretty crappy about themselves. Put it this way. The most influential person in terms of my communication and leadership style is my father, not just because I went, oh, I want to be like that. It's because I learned some really positive things and I learned what I didn't want to be. So by far, he's the one. So I'm going to therapy after today. And, um, <laughs> I thought that's what we were doing right now. Yeah. <laughs> this is Leadership Hour with Steve Adubato and Mary Gamba, contributing commentator today, Laura Van Bloom. Hey, give Laura feedback. How did she do today? You did great. You did well, great. Thanks. Oh, really? That's it? Okay. Yeah, well, okay. I know we're out of time. Uh, okay. Well, Laura, we'll Laura will get some additional air. feedback from Mary and I that she'll gladly accept. Laura, you want to say anything? You didn't uh, even want to come in here today. I had a great time. This was awesome. It is. And by the way, more importantly, we hope that you listening at home, your podcast on AM 970, you had a great time as well. I'm Steve Adubato. This has been the Leadership Hour with me and my colleague, Mary Gamba. Thank you. Check it out next time. See you then. This is Mary Gamba. Stay tuned. We'll be right back with State of Affairs with Steve Adubato, where we look at the most pressing issues facing the state of New Jersey. This edition of the Steve Adubato Leadership Hour has been made possible by New Jersey Resources. Hi, I'm Tim Sullivan. At the New Jersey Economic Development Authority, we work to drive New Jersey's economic growth and innovation to help build stronger communities within the state. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding for this edition of State of Affairs with Steve Adubato has been provided by Seton Hall University. Come see what great minds can do. Valley Bank. The New Jersey Economic Development Authority, Hackensack Meridian Health, NJM Insurance Group, Choose New Jersey. Our mission is attracting companies to the Garden State. And by ADP, a comprehensive provider of human resources technology and services. Promotional support provided by Meadowlands Chamber, building connections, driving business growth. And by NJ Biz, all business, all New Jersey.
Welcome to State of Affairs. I'm Steve Adubato. We're coming to you from the Agnes Varis NJTV studio in Newark. It is our honor and pleasure to introduce for the first time on State of Affairs, Beth Simone Novak. She's Chief Innovation Officer for the great state of New Jersey. Good to have you. Thank you. Glad to be here. Now, is this, this, by the way, we're doing a whole series on the future of innovation. Check out our website, which will come up. You can see all the programs we're doing around innovation. There is a government post about innovation, A, and B, is it the first time ever? It's the first time ever for New Jersey and one of the first states ever to have a chief innovation officer, so yes. Why have we waited this long to do this? Oh, well, a lot of states, you know, haven't done this yet. Many people haven't done it. We've thought for a long time, I would say at least a decade, about the importance of technology in government, making sure that we have computer systems that work, websites that work, that we have effective cybersecurity, and we do all of that in this state as well. But the idea of a different role, a role that really thinks about how do we use technology, data, and innovation mm. to achieve our core policies, be they economic development, educational advancement improvement, better health care, I think there's an important role for technology and innovation and data to play mm. in helping to advance our policy priorities as well. Now, you have national and international experience as well. What always fascinates me, and I tried to study this and understand it from a basic public policy point of view, but when the healthcare.gov website did not work in October of 2000 and, I don't know, check the date, 10-11. <laughs> um, I thought to myself, wait a minute, there's a policy, but for the policy to work, the website had to work. Absolutely. It didn't work. There were a lot of snafus. And I thought, what did, I often think about this, what did people in government, around government, learn from that? And what does it have to do with the future of innovation technology. I think you're absolutely right that the healthcare.gov debacle, if we can call it that at the time, well, a terrible thing was in fact a crisis that we've taken advantage of. How so? Well, of course, we saw at that point that you can't think about technology as an afterthought. You can't wonder about how do we write the legislation and then only later think about how do we implement it in practice. You need to have the lawyers and the technologists, the data scientists and the policy people sitting down side by side at the same time to talk about how do we use these new tools that are available to us to actually implement the intent of our legislation, first of all. And second of all, there are many things that we can do without legislation where we can simply create better tools, better apps, more available data that helps to achieve the same purpose. One example. So one example, right now in the state of New Jersey, we do have legislation and appropriations around better workforce development. But at the same time, one of the things that my office is doing together with the Department of Labor and Workforce Development is thinking about how do we put tools in the hands of the unemployed, especially the long-term well, unemployed. Tools. You keep using saying t tools. What do we mean Tools. Well, we're talking about things like uh, a reminder on your mobile phone that tells you what do you need to do today to help improve and accelerate your job search. We don't have to send people, though it's useful to send people also to a place, an office, a government office in the state of New Jersey. But given the technology that we have in our hands, imagine the ability to give somebody virtual counseling and mentoring via their phone or via their computer from somebody who has expertise in their field, who has expertise in job searching, and can help bring you that service where you sit. Imagine using your mobile phone or your watch to tell you, hey, Get off the couch today and uh, do your resume. Get off the couch today and network with people. That's giving the role you those of reminders. That's the role of government to drive that? So you are, I get the implication of the question, which is that a lot of this technology comes from and is developed by the private sector. Yes, but what's but the role what, of government what, if the private sector is responsible for developing it, R&D? The role of government is? So the role of government is, I think, a number of things. Number one, making sure that these tools are accessible and affordable to everybody, not just affordable That's to the people. That's a policy question. It's a policy question. It's a practical question, Economic which question. is if I'm a software company, I may be interested in selling my tools to the people who can most afford to buy them or watch my advertising. From the government standpoint, we want to ensure that everybody has access to these benefits and these tools, not just people who are in the 1% mm. or the 10%, number one. Uh, number two, making sure that we have wide distribution. And number three, I think uh, making sure that the tools that we develop and design are really serving the needs of the people, not simply serving the needs of the companies who design them. Beth, let me ask you this. Our production company, together yeah. with our, our colleagues and friends in public broadcasting, have lots of relationships, partnerships, collaborations um, with higher ed institutions. Yes. You do as well. What's the connection between higher ed and innovation in the state? Well, we have, first of all, one of the most educated states in the nation. We have a tremendous number of educated people, particularly in sciences and in engineering. We have great talent. In fact, the greatest asset we have in the state are the residents of the state itself. 
And those people are often in our universities, whether they're faculty or students or staff. So in fact, after I leave here, I'm heading to one of our universities in the state precisely to go talk about how we can take the supply of talent in the university, students, faculty, et cetera, and match that with the needs and demands and challenges that we have in the state. So a lot of what we're trying to do, knowing that we can't from a small office sitting in Trenton, that we can't do everything ourselves, is to connect the talent that we have to the challenges that we're facing. Just one quick example also sure. last year on the same day that I took office last August. August 2018. August took 2018. Office. Is that right? Yes. Uh, we <laughs> Does it also... seem longer? <laughs> I'll leave that alone. Go ahead. <laughs> it seems shorter. It's, it seems shorter and longer depending on the day of the week. Uh, we also launched a project called Research with NJ that my colleagues Research, Research with, with NJ, which is which is a catalog essentially uh, of all of beginning to be all of not there yet, um, but a large number of faculty experts, academic experts across the universities of the state, in an effort to give greater access for companies, for government, and for universities themselves to that talent across universities. So whether I'm a professor working on, let's say, smart cities that wants to find colleagues to collaborate mm. with to apply for a grant across universities, or I'm a company looking for a faculty expert, the idea is to use technology to make that expertise more accessible and more available. And that's some of what my office does, is try mm. to go around to our universities and to link the talent that we have, the very innovative talent, and match that to opportunities. There is a program called the um, New Jersey Innovation Skills Accelerator, yes. is that what it is? Training program? I mean, it's, it's got a long title. What is it and why does it matter to people watching on State of Affairs? In just this month in June, uh, we launched something called the Innovation Skills Accelerator. This is a free program online aimed first at the workforce of the state of New Jersey, but available to everybody, whether they work for towns or cities, whether they're in the private sector, universities, or just individuals sitting at home. It's an introductory course to thinking about how do we use new technology, how do mm. we use data, how do we use new ways of working and thinking, like consulting with people, asking people, talking to residents, to change how we work for the better in order to solve problems more quickly. The goal of this is to ensure that our 70,000... go ahead. The, ...is to ensure that our 70,000 public servants in New Jersey, first and foremost, are using new technology to become more effective at solving public problems, working with and talking to and collaborating with residents and using data. Beth Simone... Novak is Chief Innovation Officer in the state of New Jersey. This is part of a series we're doing on the future of innovation in the state and nationally as well. Check out our sister program, Think Tank. We'll deal with it nationally as well. Beth, I want to thank you for joining us. Thank you. Stay right there. This is State of Affairs. This is NJTV. We'll be right back. To see more State of Affairs with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at stateofaffairsnj.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Steve Adubato, Ph.D. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. We're, in fact, coming to you for a State of Affairs special segment in the uh, northern section of Camden. We're actually coming to you from the Camden Lutheran housing operation. We're pleased to enjoy and uh, be joined by our good friend Chris Calori, CEO, Cooper's Ferry Partnership. Good to see you, Chris. Good to see you, Steve. You know the Camden community very well. What's going on today that is different from just five years ago? Three things. One, uh, the neighborhoods in Camden have never been more safe than they've been today, at least going back 50 years. Number two, the K-12 through education system is more stable than it's been in recent memory. Just to give you two quick examples, graduation rate today is 69%. In 2012, it was 49%. So uh, what you're, and the third thing is the number of companies that are moving in here are uh, more than they've ever been, and that is primarily because of the tax credit uh, program, but equally important, there is a belief among residents and business leaders that this city is at an inflection point, a good inflection point. You know, to, to be clear and to clarify things, Cooper's Ferry Partnership that Chris will explain is involved in a lot of development. Our team's going to go out and shoot some footage of some of those projects. What is the initiative? How long has it been around? And what are we going to see? Cooper's Ferry Partnership is a uh, private nonprofit. It, we're a community development and economic development nonprofit that's been around for 34 years. Uh, we have been the primary nonprofit, along with others, 
uh, that work with foundations, governments, and corporations to make sure things like park projects are built, uh, road projects are built, and to make sure that we provide a platform for companies to move into Canada. Okay, so how hot is, okay, you got, you got an economic development thing going on. You got a lot of activity. You're going to see that footage. But we're in the northern section of Camden. As we walked onto the street, there's a, lot, there's a jackhammer working. We tried to get them to stop, but they said, no, we got we things to do. This is Camden. We're trying to build the community. This is a particularly challenging area, um, economically disadvantaged. We're actually doing an initiative with our friend uh, Pino Rodriguez, who heads up the initiative, the Block Supporter Initiative, not as big as yours as a nonprofit, but they're making a difference block by block. But that's the story about Camden. Uh, this isn't about one individual or one organization that is helping the city move forward. It is a collective effort. The, the bottom line uh, for, for people on the ground is this city and the residents of the city, like Pino Rodriguez, have never lost faith in where the city can be. And the fact that we're able to realize the dreams of generations that have not seen the prosperity uh, reflects on the commitment by individuals across a broad spectrum, whether it is political, whether it is business, or whether it's resident-driven programs like the one that Pino is heading. That's what's making a difference. So what I'm suggesting to you is, unlike perhaps other cities in the state, there is no daylight between political leaders, business leaders, and residents on what needs to happen in the city to make sure it becomes uh, more uh, uh, prosperous. Chris, let me ask you this. Crime is a serious issue in this community. Public education, a serious issue in challenging this community. With the crime rate being what it is, and it's, it is in fact technically going down, we'll talk about that more, but the education system, again, improving, but not where it wants and needs to be. Graduation rates, not where anyone wants them to be. <clears throat> How challenging is it to engage in successful economic development with the crime situation and the public school situation? I think the focus really has to be on intergenerational poverty. What does that mean? That means you have to make sure that the fundamentals of the city are working. That means that we gotta make sure the neighborhoods are safe. You gotta make sure that people have an opportunity to succeed both in getting an education and in getting a job. That's how I think you build a stable community. The fact that the progress that has happened in the last five and a half years is measurable uh, and it has been meaningful demonstrate that we are at a very special point in this city. It, and I want to be clear, from 1968 to almost 2007, the city was socially and economically isolated. That is Define isolated. As in, as in the only investments that were coming in were the state uh, deciding to build a prison on the waterfront. Uh, the only investments that were coming in were what I would call socially unacceptable investments. That was what was happening then. And what I'm suggesting to you is the residents uh, have always had a belief that this city deserved the kind of opportunity that we're finally seeing. That's how you get the crime rates down. That's how you make sure you build an education system that reaches every child in the city. And that's what I think is happening. So this isn't a trend line. This is an absolute data-driven uh, analysis that points to objectively where the city is today and where it's going. So you speak about where it's going, Chris. You know the city better than most. Five to ten years from now, describe Camden. I think. Five and by the way, Camden is lots of different communities. That's right. Describe Camden in its totality five to ten years from now. So I think five to ten years from now, two to things, two things are going to happen. One is the state currently subsidizes most of the city and the school district uh, to the tune of 75 to 80 percent. I actually think within 10 years or soon thereafter, you're going to see a stabilization of the, the tax system, which is, as you know, foundational to making sure any system, any city survives and grows. What you mean one. is that the rateables will be there. That's right, because the businesses that are coming in are going to begin paying property taxes that there is no, for, as I said, for 50 years, there weren't any tax-paying entities that were moving into the city. So the city became more reliant on state government. So what we're, what we're suggesting is, for once, 
we're building a foundation for taxation uh, and to make sure there's revenue attached to it. You bullish on Camden? I am. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't be here. <laughs> otherwise, the commitment that the residents have made wouldn't be realized. And that's the thing that I want you to take away from this. Folks like Pino and the folks like the fo uh, uh, Betsy at uh, Camden Lutheran. We'll be talking to Betsy in just a couple minutes. Go ahead. Right. They are the people that are driving the change. And, and, I, and I think it's often lost because uh, it isn't uh, quite, it doesn't, uh, doesn't get the kind of amplification that other projects perhaps but it's huge. get. But it is huge because if you're able to change the narrative on a neighborhood level, then you change it on a citywide level. And that's what the promise of the city is. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. To see more State of Affairs with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at stateofaffairsnj.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Once again, we're joined by our good friend Carlos Rodriguez, President, CEO, Community Food Bank of New Jersey. Tell folks, Carlos, what the food bank is and why it matters so much. Well, the food bank is the primary uh, fighter against hunger uh, throughout New Jersey. And we're doing it two ways. First, making sure that we can take care of that immediate need for food, but also looking uh, and trying to solve why that need exists in the first place. So let's do this. We're doing this program in the summer of 2019. Summer hunger is? Summer hunger is over 400,000 children in our state that rely on school meals, whether it be breakfast or lunch. And during the summer, those meals are gone. So families are working hard, uh, not having that school breakfast or school lunch uh, that they relied on or counted on during the school year and now have to fend for themselves the during impact? the summer. The impact is, you know, we're, our, the, our response is more of 100,000 meals every summer that we're helping to produce and creating awareness around where those meals uh, can exist in areas of high need. You know, what I'm curious, you and I were talking right before we got on the air, <clears throat> that, and by the way, we're involved in a public awareness initiative with the Community Food Bank to talk about food insecurity and related issues. One of the things that struck me, some of our higher ed partners uh, and folks we work with at Seton Hall and at, um, also at Berkeley, is that you know, food insecurity affects college students in a certain way. A, how are college students affected? And B, what are colleges doing together with the food bank to deal with it directly to help their students? Well, I mean, first, you, get, you have to think that 900,000 people in New Jersey are in need of food, are food insecure. Eight plus million folks, 900,000. Exactly. That's close to 10% of the population. That's almost every one. So to find, to, to realize that there is need in college campus shouldn't be a surprise. Hunger exists in every community and throughout every demographic in our state. Whose responsibility is that? That's all of our responsibility. It's private sector, it's charitable sector, it's government sector coming together because our state will not thrive if hunger exists. So some colleges are in fact they have food pantries right on campus, right? So since about 2014, we've been working with various colleges to help them start a food pantry, to support the food pantry, and to help them understand what else can be done for their college uh, population. Uh, many students just struggle, for, especially first-generation students, just to get into school and to manage the reality of and the balance of, of paying for going to school and paying for life. How do you get them life. to do it? Because I know the Berkeley folks ac actually in Newark, on the Newark campus, I, literally a mile from here, have it. How do you, you get them to do it? See, it starts with awareness. And in many cases, the awareness comes from within. Uh, so once we started promoting, I mean, we learned everything from talking to our neighbors. So we found a neighbor that was in a college, uh, in college going to local pantries. One thing led to another about five years ago. And now we have over 16 programs that we've helped start or support throughout the state. How do you get students, because uh, the other part of this is we found out there are community service initiatives where students are involved in what? So most of, them, yeah, most, of the, most of the college uh, campuses have students that are involved either in food drives, helping to pick up the food, helping to actually run the pantry. Uh, and, and some of our more advanced models, you're helping to coordinate services within those pantries. Because chances are if you're, if you're in need of food, there's probably other things you're eligible for and are not aware of. Well, let's talk about this whole question. Because we're talking about these food problems, and I'm looking at my notes because Jackie Heyer and I were talking about this, and I'm like, how do we have this huge problem with food insecurity? There are so many people struggling to find healthy food, and then you've got food waste. That's exactly Make right. sense of that for well, us. Well, because the problem of hunger in our community, in our society even, is not a lack of food. It's a lack of access to food. 
And so there's this disparity that we actually have a lot of food. We actually have food waste as a byproduct of that. What we don't have is people with the financial means to go and shop when the food is ready and consumable. So one of the things that we do um, is make sure, and we've been in this business for over 45 years, the food, the anti-food waste build, uh, business, making sure that before food becomes waste, we can rescue it and we can put it in the hands of our New Jerseyans who need it most. You know, uh, you're a nonprofit, we're a nonprofit, NJTV is a nonprofit, but we have to run lean, right? We have to raise money all the time. Talk about the role that you and your organization have to play when it comes to getting corporations to care about this when they're saying, wait a minute, we got bottom line issues, we're a publicly traded company sometimes, we got stock price, and then you're saying I gotta be involved in Community Food Bank, talk about that. Well, the great news is in New Jersey, if you're a major corporation, you're involved with the Community Food Bank of New Jersey. And you should be, because you're not going to have a thriving workforce. You're not going to have a consumer base. You're not going to have an educated um, uh, population if they're hungry. All of these things, if you, th you think about the, the fundamental basic thing that food is, you're not going to uh, develop if you're a child. You're not going to learn whether you're an adult, young adult or a child. And you're not going to have the strength to be the smartest workforce that you can be. So this is very much an issue that crosses across all sectors. And by the way, Valley, one of the folks that are they're doing that actually helped create a, an initiative? Yeah, they're Valley, uh, one of our newest uh, funders and partners, uh, and they, they came in to support our workforce development initiative. What does that mean? That is, we have a 15-week program where we teach uh, uh, adults life skills and culinary arts while they're learning and then they get job placement. And while they do that, they help us prepare the meals for the after school programs and the summer meals programs we spoke about. Because how does, how does what we're describing right now and other issues actually help the quote unquote root causes of hunger and food insecurity? Well, our workforce development uh, piece is clear. Uh, so we're taking, we're not just providing the food, we're, we're, we're teaching, we're doing the proverbial teach you how to fish. Uh, and then, you know, with job placement rates is over 90%, uh, the impact is big not only for the individual but for the community as well. The other thing that we do is we connect families with resources. So SNAP uh, outreach is something that Tell we... Tell folks, SNAP is the... SNAP is formally for... known as food stamps, right. right? That's the easiest way to describe it. And so many working families uh, and individuals are eligible and don't know that they're eligible because it's, for, it's primarily designed for working families. But when you fall in need all of a sudden, the last thing you think is that that program is for you. You know, before I let you out here, we talked about uh, the problem on college campuses and other places. Young children. We have a serious initiative called Right from the Start NJ that looks, like inf looks at infants and toddlers and the challenges they have, the things they need. How, does, how do these issues affect that population? By the way, put up the right from the start engine. Here, team's already six steps ahead, go ahead. So one in seven children are, suffer from food insecurity in New Jersey. Uh, in counties like Atlantic, Cape May, and Cumberland, it's as high as one in five children don't know where the next meal is coming from. So if you think about a child who goes to school uh, on an empty stomach and, or wakes up on an empty stomach. How, she, how can he or she learn? Well, exactly right. How do they develop during those early developmental uh, years? Uh, so it's a critical part. It's really the fuel that helps us grow, that helps us uh, be as product, productive individuals in our society. And we all have invested interest in that. A few seconds left. Do you sense cause that, that we're more committed, we care more than we had in the past, have in the past? about these issues? I'm hopeful. Seconds. I am absolutely hopeful. We have commitments from the private sectors, from individuals, and now from the government sector. We have renewed interest. Um, very um, um, proud to be working with our legislature and our governor on a slate of bills that are comprehensive in their approach and making sure that there's funding available. But there's a lot of work to do. Let, absolutely. And there's also a lot of uh, programming to be done on this. Uh, Carlos will be back in the late, in late 2019. Give us an update. Talk about those legislative initiatives. Carlos Rodriguez, President and CEO of Community Food Bank of New Jersey, thank you for joining us on State of Affairs. I'm Steve Arabato. This is NJTV's Agnes Vera Studio in Newark. We'll check it out next time. State of Affairs with Steve Arabato is a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 30 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of State of Affairs with Steve Adubato has been provided by Seton Hall University, Valley Bank, the New Jersey Economic Development Authority, Hackensack Meridian Health, NJM Insurance Group, Choose New Jersey, and by ADP. Promotional support provided by Meadowlands Chamber and by NJBiz. 
NJM Insurance Company has been serving New Jersey policyholders for more than 100 years. But just who are NJM's policyholders? They're the men and women who teach our children, the public sector employees who maintain our infrastructure, the workers who craft our manufactured goods, and New Jersey's next generation of leaders, the people who make our state a great place to call home. NJM, we've got New Jersey covered.